Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my talk is going to be about uh, the Broccoli build tool. I'm Joe. Uh, I'm the author of Broccoli. And uh, before I dive into the sort of technical um, details of what Broccoli is, let me give you some background to motivate it. So uh, who in here has used Rails? That's a lot of people. The Rails asset pipeline, it's pretty good, right? Like it just does a lot of things for you and you can like plug in compilers and stuff. But it's tied to Rails and we would like something like the Rails asset pipeline for any backend. So what a lot of the time what people have been doing is um, they've been using grunt uh, tasks to compile all their files together. And then if you have a sort of regular app, what tends to happen is um, you have this grunt file that compiles CoffeeScript or ES6 JavaScript maybe and handlebars templates. And then it concatenates some stuff and then it also um, compiles SAS and then you have a minification step at the end. You probably have a few more steps in there. So you have this pretty long grunt file that you're having to write from scratch. And what's also kind of unpleasant about this is that you're having to manage all the intermediate build products, right? You're having a CoffeeScript compiler whose output goes into a concatenator, whose output goes into a SAS plugin, uh, into a, a minifier. And so the intermediate files, the intermediate build products, you are having to um, manage temporary directories for all of those. And so when you make grunt files, a lot of the time you end up kind of juggling all these pieces, um, trying to, trying to fit, some, fit them together. And another thing that happens is, so you want to like edit a file in the editor and then reload in the browser, right? Um, so you, you fire up grunt watch, you edit a file, save, reload in the browser, it works. But you have a medium sized team, like five people, and you work on your app for a few months and your app grows and grows, and the rebuilds become slower. And so half a year later, what happens is you edit a file, you save, and then you wait for like 10 seconds while it's rebuilding, it's rebuilding, still rebuilding, and then you reload. And that's really, really painful, right? Like this experience of having something that is so core to your um, experience as a developer, this like edit, reload, edit, reload cycle, having that disrupted by this, these really slow rebuilds is a problem. Um, and so, so we want two things, right? We want chainable plugins and we want fast rebuilds. And that is the, um, that is what Broccoli aims to solve. So let me uh, demo what writing a broccoli build definition actually looks like. Um, I made a screen recording, so I don't have to type. So here we have a little sample app with a lib and a vendor directory, which contain the JavaScript and CoffeeScript files. And uh, we have a public directory with some static files and a styles directory with SAS in it. And so the Brock file is going to contain our build definition, and I'm going to just derive it from scratch now. Um, there's some require calls at the top, but other than that, we're just going to write it now. Um, so we're going to start by exporting the public directory. So the, the central unit of data that Broccoli cares about is a directory. Broccoli calls it a tree, a tree of files, if you will. So if we do this and then we run Broccoli serve, it's just going to serve all the files in the public directory. And if we run Broccoli build dist, it's going to copy all the files in the public directory into the disk directory. So that's pretty unexciting, but let's add the files in the lib directory. So what we're going to do is call the merge trees plugin, um, which takes the lib directory and the public directory and copies them on top of each other. And then the resulting uh, directory containing the files of both of these directories is going to be what, what is returned by merge trees. Now that we're exporting that, um, we can access the files in the lib directory and the public directory. But we have CoffeeScript files in the lib directory and we would like them to be compiled to JavaScript first. So what we're going to do is create a new variable called libcompile. 
And we're going to call the coffee script filter on the lib, on the lib directory. And the coffee script filter is going to, going to take all the .coffee files and replace them with .js files. And what the filter coffee script plugin returns is a new tree, a new directory, if you will. And we can just use that tree in place of lib. So in place of this string right here, we're going to use lib compiled, the result of the coffee script compiler. But right now we have to, we are having to um, put everything in a single file, and we would really like to um, have a concatenator. So we're going to create a new tree called app.js and concatenate the files in the lib compiled uh, tree. Just take all the JavaScript files and uh, output them into one big app.js blob. And so app.js is actually, it looks like it's a file, but it's not a file. It's a tree containing one directory, assets, which contains one file, app.js. So even though we are kind of, we only care about a file, the primitive unit that Broccoli cares about is still the tree. And now instead of lib compile, what we're going to do is put the app.js. So now we're having the public directory and app.js. Uh, next, we are going to uh, add a jQuery. So jQuery lives in our vendor directory. What we're going to do now is merge the lib compiled tree and the vendor tree into a combined tree, and then just pass that into the concatenator. And we want the jQuery file first. And now we have jQuery. And finally, we do a similar thing that we did with app.js. We're going to do that with uh, app CSS. Uh, kick off the SAS compiler for the, um, on the styles directory. We're going to take the app.sas file, including all the files that it imports, and dump that into a big app.css blob. And then we're going to merge that into the output. So this is what a Brock file looks like. This is a fully functional Brock file. Um, but I want to like, run this by you again in a more visual manner. So let's, let's go back to the slides and visualize what's going on. Um, so we take the lib directory. We run the CoffeeScript compiler, get a lib compiled tree. Um, then we merge the lib compiled tree and the vendor tree into a single JavaScript tree. We run the concatenator, get an app.js tree. We run SAS on the styles tree, get an app.css tree. And then we merge app.js, app.css, and public into a single output tree. And this graph structure, this, um, this notion that um, you can express a build process by assembling um, compilers that take one or multiple trees and return one output tree. This notion is really central to uh, Broccoli's architecture. This is basically the core um, architectural insight that is encapsulated in Broccoli, um, that taking trees and returning trees is a suitable primitive for expressing, um, for expressing build processes. And if you ever write a build tool for like some other environment, let's say native, um, please copy this. This is much better than like the make way of um, creating a dependency graph of files. And I, I talked about like speed earlier, and the, the way we make this fast, this is right now what we're doing is we're just kicking off the entire thing every time we rebuild. Um, and if we don't, if we're not smart about what we rebuild, um, if we have 100 CoffeeScript files in the lib directory, we're going to recompile them every time, even though they haven't changed. And it's going to be really slow. And what Broccoli does is, it requires, it asks that plugins um, cache their build outputs. So the CoffeeScript plugin uses some common caching code. Um, and if, if you have 100 CoffeeScript files and one of them has changed, it's going to rebuild that one CoffeeScript file. And the other 99, it's going to detect that they haven't changed and pull the output from the cache. So it has a, has a cache internally that... Um, that allows it to um, rebuild things very fast when they haven't changed. This means that we don't have to, we don't need to um, track which files depend on, which input files 
which output files depend on which input files throughout the entire tree. But if every single plugin is fast by itself, then the whole thing, we can kick off the entire build process, and it's going to be very fast um, when everything runs. Um, so just as a warning, Broccoli is still zero point, and I hope that it's going to be uh, 1.0 by the end of the year or early next year. Um, but in the meantime, there are still some uh, API refactorings coming up. So it's not completely stable yet. And there are some uh, performance regressions that, that we've had that we uh, still have to fix. Uh, one insight that we got from Grunt was that um, when you make a tool like this, it's really smart to keep the API very, very small. Because every piece of API that you expose, uh, once it's out there um, for a build tool or for Grunt, for a task runner, you can never change it again because there's this entire ecosystem of plugins that depend on it. So uh, with Broccoli, we tried really hard to keep the API minimal and uh, push a lot of the complexity of like all oh, this caching stuff all, that makes the performance happen, push all of that into external libraries that get used by the plugins so that Broccoli Core actually doesn't know about, about a lot of things. Now, I showed you how to make a Brock, how to make a Brock file, how to make your own build definition. But I really, ideally, I don't want, um, if you create a new app, it would be nice if you didn't have to deal with all of this, right? Even though it's architecturally neat, uh, it's not technically necessary that you have to think about all of this graph stuff. It would be nice if it just worked. And one of the insights that Ember got from Rails is that our apps are not so special. Like, if we just have a lot of shared code in the framework, we don't have to, um, we don't have to reinvent a build process ourselves every time. And I think that's a really crucial insight. And, and what Rails is doing is really great. You do Rails new, my app, and you just get all of this stuff generated for you, wired up. You do not have to write a build definition or anything. And that's how, really how I want Broccoli to be used. Um, the same way like the Rails asset pipeline, you, don't, you never directly interact with it. It just works. And um, that's kind of how I, how I want Broccoli to be used as well, just as a library inside of a bigger tool. Um, just to clarify one thing, because I was um, talking about Grunt earlier, I don't think Grunt is a bad tool. Um, it's just a task runner. It's not a build tool. So. Um, I think you should be using a dedicated build tool like Broccoli for your um, core build pipeline. But something like Grunt is still very useful to kick off tests or to generate things, uh, to deploy, etc. cetera. Um, so we have a Grunt Broccoli uh, plugin that uh, plugs the Broccoli build tool into the Grunt task runner. <laughs> but I think what all of you are really excited about is Ember CLI. Um, and much of the credit for Ember CLI goes to uh, Stefan Penner and uh, Robert Jackson, who have been doing a lot of work on it. And um, this is the primary user of Broccoli right now, Ember CLI. Uh, it's, it uses uh, Broccoli as its build pipeline. And I want to demo to you what you can do with uh, Ember CLI. So Ember CLI is kind of like Rails. We do Ember new. Emberfest app, and it generates a new app for us. Networking happens. There we go. Installing, installing, installing. Okay. So we CD into the new app that we generated, and we have all of this scaffolding generated for us already, kind of like when you generate a new Rails app. And now we can start up the server, and drop into the browser, and there's our Ember app running. And now let's, let's generate some stuff. Ember builds, um, Ember brings some generators. So now we can use Ember CLI to, um, actually, let's, let's take a look at the app directory first. So this is our application, and all of the JavaScript code, all of the production code lives in the app directory. So let's go in there. 
Uh, let's look around. So you have probably done something like this before, right? You, you have an Ember app and you just put it into directories, you structure it in a sensible way, and everybody kind of reinvents this. And Ember CLI, what Ember CLI brings you is it gives you a default directory structure so that when you come onto a new team and they have an Ember app, they all look the same. They all use the same directory structure. They are already structured for you. You don't have to reinvent anything. So let's edit one of the templates. Okay, and it live reloads immediately in the browser. So let's use one of the generators here um, just to show this up. Like, Ember brings so many generators. This is awesome. You can just like generate a new model. You don't have to figure out from the documentation how to do it. Just have it generated for you. It comes out correctly, and you can start filling in your stuff. So I think this is really going to help make the learning, cur learning curve for Ember a lot easier, um, just being able to generate all these parts for your application. So for demo purposes, we're just going to generate a route. Um, let's add a navigation bar to the top. Um, okay. So we have these two routes, but they just don't contain anything yet. So let's edit the foo route. Let's put something in there and switch to the browser. And now we can switch back and forth, and it's working. So this is just to show off the generators. Um, it generated route definitions for us. You don't have to figure out how to use the router. It just generates it for you. Um, but something that's also really cool that I want to show off is um, now that we have a now that we have a standardized build pipeline, we can exploit that fact to um, have tools running on top of it that deploy it to platforms. The same way you can deploy a Rails app to Heroku. We can now deploy Ember apps to static hosting services. So DivShot is kind of, I want to show off DivShot because DivShot is kind of like Heroku for, um, Heroku for static apps. So we're going to Google Ember CLI DivShot and just follow the instructions on this uh, package. npm install. OK. Uh, Ember generate. So this thing brings a generator that generates the div shot configuration for you. And then finally, we deploy. And it's going to push it. It's going to create a new app. And there's our URL. Let's open it up. And it works. We have a, running em a working Ember app on the internet um, within five minutes. We went from zero to a deployed app on DivShot. And I think this is, really, this is really awesome, streamlining the entire tooling process from creating your app all the way to deploying. So I'm really, I'm really excited about Amber CLI. Um, as a warning, it's 0 0.0.41 right now. So it's very much alpha. There are pieces in it that are still going to change. Um, but if you are creating a new uh, app right now, I would encourage you to give it a try and see if it works for you. So one thing that we're trying to achieve with this um, is also making it easier to share code. And obviously, we're, we want to share components, right? Like the uh, jQuery UI date picker, that kind of epitomizes components for me, like this widget consisting of behavior and templates and styling. Um, and because we, we think about apps in very visual terms, I guess, because they run in the browser, um, but I think components are actually just one part of it. And a lot of the really interesting stuff is not in components. If you look at the average Rails apps gem file, it actually doesn't contain a lot of widgets. Most of the really exciting stuff is 
compilers that give you new languages or libraries that allow you to express problems in completely new ways. Um, so for example, Ember Data is an awesome example of something that takes you from AJAX calls to a data persistence library. And so this kind of stuff, enabling this kind of code sharing, I think, is really central to, um, to making the web platform evolve faster. So let's talk about what we are missing for that, for code sharing to really happen. Some of these things are kind of work in progress, but they don't work really great yet. Um, so Ember CLI's API needs to evolve a little bit. Um, it's still, we are still figuring things out, um, but I think that's going to get there. Another thing is the package manager. Um, we have NPM, but it's... It has made some architectural choices that work well for Node, but that do not work at all well for the web. Um, we have Bower, uh, and Bower goes, I think, in the right direction, um, but it's just missing a lot of pieces. So, in my view, the solution for package management is pretty well understood. It's basically whatever Bundler is doing on Ruby, let's get that for the web. So, in particular, conflict resolution and uh, locking, version locking, um, upgrading. So let's say you want to upgrade one library but keep all the other libraries the same. This kind of upgrading is Bundler does really well. Um, and a central registry, like the Ruby Gems registry. So this is kind of what we want for the web. Um, and the reason I think it hasn't happened is that it's just a lot of complexity to implement. It's not that um, there's nothing fundamentally stopping us from doing this. It's just that Bundler is a, it looks simple. It has a very simple interaction surface, but under the hood, it's doing a lot of awesome stuff and it has a lot of lines of code that are really um, doing a lot of heavy lifting for you. And I think uh, once we have this kind of thing implemented for the web, maybe a more powerful bower, um, we will be in a better position to uh, share packages. Interestingly, though, um, there's another piece missing. And if you use Bundler on Ruby, something that you probably don't think about is you can just say, require that library in your Ruby code, and it will pick up the .rb files in the library. And that's because when you um, have a Ruby gem installed in your app, Bundler will automatically add those Ruby gems to your load path. And so your require calls will search in the load paths of all the gems that you have included. And uh, they will, you can now include the, you can now require the, the files that those gems supply. But JavaScript doesn't come with a require call. It does not have a native notion of uh, inter-module dependencies. We, we do have AMD and Browserify, which are module systems that solve this in uh, different ways. But the problem with that is that AMD and Browserify uh, happen at runtime. They are not statically analyzable. So if you wanted to figure out at build time which files you need to concatenate, um, you need to rely on heuristics to parse out the AMD calls. And that's really, really painful. And so that's why I'm really excited about the upcoming uh, ES6 modules. They are in draft right now. They might still change a little bit, but we have a we have an existing uh, transpiler, and the um, default app, the app that's generated by Ember CLI, uses ES6 modules already. So the syntax is like import Ember from Ember, or import view from Ember slash views. Um, and this syntax is uh, statically parsable, so. A tool like uh, Ember CLI, like Broccoli, can uh, walk your JavaScript files at build time, figure out which files belong to, to your app and which files don't need to be included, and concatenate them into one big blob that you can ship out over the network without extra round trips. Um, how much time do I have? How many minutes? Five or ten? Which one? <laughs> um, 
All right, so, so let me go on a tangent real quick, um, because I think something is, something is kind of missing um, in the way we do open source right now. So some of these are pretty well understood problems, like the package manager, like we've been waiting for a package manager for years, and it's still like it's coming along very slowly. And so the web platform is this huge thing, right? It's like hundreds of billions of dollars are riding on the web platform. But some stuff that is really central to the web, like the Ember ecosystem, um, a lot of that is being done right now by um, just a handful of people working after hours. So the, the time that we are spending as a community on these tools is really, really low compared to the um, size of the platform. And I think it's much lower than um, what, let's say, Apple or Google are spending on iOS or Android. So when I, when I wrote Broccoli, I took a few months off. Um, I run a business, um, but I thought it was important to solve this problem. And I also thought it would make me a better developer, and I hope that it has. Um, but the productivity increases that Broccoli brings by giving me faster bills, they don't really make a huge difference for me. But if I was on a team with 100 people, it would very easily make a difference. Like, just one person writing a build tool, if the, if the other 99 get a 1% productivity increase from that, that pays off for itself very quickly. So it seems to me that um, on a lot of larger teams, um, there's not really a lot of time spent innovating on the tooling like Broccoli, like Ember CLI, like Ember. Um, and most of the time is spent on the app that the business is doing. And that is really strange, right? Like what people and, and what I see people doing is they have these, they take these tools that we have, these open source tools as kind of God given um, tools that they cannot change and they cannot evolve and they cannot add their own. But then they um, add their, their own hacks on top of these tools to make them work. So they have like these ludicrously complex build processes and like this infrastructure that they spend a lot of time maintaining um, these hacks that just to make all of this stuff work for them. And then the next iteration of tooling comes along. They throw all of that away, build something new, build new, tool, build new hacks on top of that. And so, like, it would be much more efficient if instead of putting internal hacks in place, we would start really innovating on tooling in a way that is shared across the industry so that when we write something, it, other people build on top of it and it makes a lasting difference rather than just a hack for us that works for the next three, three years. So if one person in a team of 100 works on improving the tooling, clearly that is efficient, right? All we need to get is like a 1% productivity increase. It works out. The math works out very easily. So how much can we, how much can we spend? My hypothesis would be that we want to spend on the order of 50% on tooling. So if you have a team with 20 people, you probably want 10 people working on tooling, working on making the other 10 more productive, and 10 people actually creating the app for your business. And I, I would hypothesize that that quite easily pays off um, in the long run, over a few years. Like if we can afford to take a, to take a, a view beyond like the next round, the next acquisition, um, the next quarter, and think about like where we're gonna be in five years, that would very easily be efficient. And in fact, if you have a, if you have a um, team of 10 people and half of them produce open source nine through five, like full time, you would start being very visible in the web space. And if you have a team of 100 people and 50 of them produce open source, you would dominate the web. Like, you would, you would be like the primary creator of open source in the web space right there. So I know a lot of you 
are CEOs or CTOs or um, your company considers you important enough to send you to a conference. So um, this sounds great in theory, right? But if we, if we want to do this in practice, I think if you, if you wanted to kind of implement this in your company, in your business, and make more open source work happen, I think what that kind of requires is a, in that moment where you write open source, you are not working on the product. You're not working on something that will directly make money. And that is kind of hard. Like I was, I was stepping away from a profitable business to work on broccoli and I could have shipped features, but I, instead I chose to work on open source. And so it kind of requires having a bit of discipline to, to refrain from, from shipping, to not ship and to work on something long term. Um, so I think a bit getting away from this, we need to ship something today and taking a bit of, a bit more long term view about like, how do we solve things properly? How do we, what kind of library do we need to make this, for this to work well? Kind of like developing a bit like academia, developing uh, an appreciation, not just for something that works now, but for profoundly new solutions, for something that is really, that changes the way we, we write stuff. And it, I guess it also requires that people are, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the year, people are evaluated not just by how much do they contribute to the app directly, how much, how many features did they make, but also how many, how many lasting improvements to the tooling did you make? Um, I think shifting, shifting to this kind of longer term outlook could really, um, could really change how we, how we operate and uh, the, the speed at which, we, uh, at which we push the web platform forward. So I'm, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, but I hope, that, um, I hope that other people will as well, that we can kind of get more appreciation for um, how important it is and how profitable it can be to, um, to work on open source, um, to innovate on the tooling itself and not just write an app. Um, Okay, that's the end of my rant. Thank you. <laughs> and if we have, do we have time for questions? Or should we wrap up? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm not, I'm actually, I have all of two commits in Ember CLI. I know you're all excited about Ember CLI, but I'm not the expert on it. So if you have questions, maybe on broccoli or something. Yes. A cache, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everything is, in general, stuff, the cache is sometimes in memory, sometimes on disk. Um, it always gets blown away between restarts. Oh, the disk is very, very fast. Um, so, Yeah, so I didn't get into this in detail, um, but something that Grunt does, I guess this is what you're referring to, is you have like 100 output files and you just leave them there and then you rebuild on top of that. Is that what you mean? So if you do that, um, Broccoli starts with a clean slate every time. It just wipes everything clean and um, then rebuilds the entire thing from scratch. And that is important because um, it's, it's hard to know when files, when a given file need to be, needs to be rebuilt. So let's say your app.sass file includes a mixins.sass file. Now, if you change your mixins.sass file, you need to rebuild the app.sass file. And so keeping track of these dependencies across compilers in a compiler chain is really tricky. And the way it is done with Grunt, uh, with tools like Grunt, is usually, um, there's usually problems where you are not expressing this dependency chain correctly. And in particular, something that um, all tools in the make lineage of build tools suffer from is when you delete a file, it normally doesn't know to delete the output file. So when I delete the file in my input tree, it's just going to stick around in the output tree and I have to do make clean uh, and rebuild everything. And that's not an academic problem. That's, that happens every time you switch a branch. 
um, something probably gets deleted, some, something gets moved around. And so not dealing with these, with these problems properly um, really throws a, throws a wrench in the, in the reliability of your pipeline. Uh, so the question is, is there a roadmap to uh, Broccoli 1.0? Um, not right now, actually. I should probably just put it in a document. Um, there's like two uh, upcoming changes to the plugin API that hopefully will, will um, we will provide a lot of compatibility code to make that happen. Um, so I'm going to write that up and tweet about it. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, by the way. Um, and I tweet it out. Yes. So uh, the question is, if you broccoli shows which um, trees take the most amount of time, which plugin eat up the most amount of time, how do you debug it? Um, I think you probably need to know the plugin code. You need to pop open the, the source code um, and look at that, actually. Um, there is no kind of easy way. In, in the future, at the moment, we're having a bit of a performance regression, um, but that's going to be fixed in a, in a few weeks hopefully sooner. Um, but by then, I hope that most trees will be extremely fast, like 10 milliseconds or less. And there's going to be like maybe one tree or two trees that are slow. And if there's one tree that persistently shows up that is slow, even though you haven't changed any of the files, then you know that you can just send off a bug report and say, hey, please fix this. Your tree is, your plugin is taking up a lot of time in the build process, even though it should just be instantaneous. Um, so Broccoli doesn't currently provide a way to drill down into like what inside a plugin is taking up time, which subdirectory or something like that. It's just like by plugin, this plugin is taking up time. All right, thank you everyone.